Hi there, folks. I can see people starting to connect. That's wonderful. Hello. We'll just give it a few minutes while people's connections take, take hold there. Oh, my goodness. I see somebody, and I think they have in the background a Kandinsky work on their wall. You do. You totally do. Perfect. That's what we're talking about today. <laughs> I was just saying to my colleagues that it would be great if we had some other examples other than the one we have at the AGO, so we can just all look at your, <laughs> look at your screen there. Perfect. Amazing. <laughs> I don't know if you chose this room on purpose or if you usually Zoom from here, but uh, you're in a great spot. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> that is totally perfect. Okay, looks like everyone is mostly connected. That's wonderful. So, welcome to the Art Gallery of Ontario Senior Social event for this month. My name is Lauren Spring, and I'm an art educator with the AGO. And we have a really fun session planned today. Some of you I know have been here before and know a little bit how it works. Others are brand new, so I'll just review a few logistical things before we delve into looking at the art and making our own art. Um, so we are going to look at two pieces of art. We're focusing on abstraction today, and I've selected two of my favorite abstract artists out there. So um, one is Denise Tomasos, who is a Canadian artist. Some folks may have encountered her work at the AGO or elsewhere before. Um, really a huge talent, sadly died um, much too young a number of years ago. And then we also have uh, Wesley Kandinsky, so born Russian, spent a lot of time in, in Germany, a little bit of time in Paris too, and very distinct sort of abstract periods um, of his you know, career and oeuvre. And, uh, so, and then we're going to be making a, our own work of art that's inspired by Kandinsky's style. So if, of course, if this were in person, we'd be walking through the gallery together and looking at these works and going down to the basement studio to, to create and get messy. Um, but we're doing it from the comfort of our homes, which is the next best thing. I'll also point out that um, I really like to keep these interactive. We have such intelligent folks who join us who, you know, have varying levels of art knowledge and art history background and anything goes, right? You can ask any question at all if you have advice you want to share. Um, maybe you're a Kandinsky aficionado and you live with a, one of his prints in your home, <laughs> as we can see, um, and you really, you know, want to share what you love about his style, you're more than welcome to do that. I welcome you to sort of unmute yourselves and use your voice when you want to respond, but if that's uncomfortable for you or you'd rather just type into the chat, that's totally fine too. I have that open on my screen and I can easily uh, see your thoughts and your questions there as well. So here we go. Here is a picture of our beautiful Art Gallery of Ontario. So located right in downtown Toronto on Dundas Street. I imagine some of you are probably joining from Toronto today too, but I'd love to hear kind of a little bit where you're from. Um, so if you want to type into the chat the, the city, the province that you're joining from today, others, often we have folks from the States. Okay. Oh, we've got someone from Vancouver. Perfect. Toronto, a few Toronto folks. Lovely. Toronto, living in London, but lived in Toronto for many years. Perfect. Uh, Orangeville, Sutton, Quebec. Oh, we've got good friends uh, in Sutton, Quebec. Fredericton, New Brunswick, Mississauga, Niagara Falls. Great. So a nice mix. And some of you are sort of within public transit or, or driving or biking distance to the AGO. Uh, Ottawa, the Kandinsky people, very nice. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> That's our Kandinsky crew in Ottawa. I love it. Um, and so, uh, yeah, just so you know, if folks are able to travel to the Art Gallery of Ontario, we have a number of really great exhibits on right now, sort of temporary, temporary special exhibitions. We have Picasso's Blue Period. We have... Um, one that just opened that if you're able to, I highly recommend seeing it's Robert Houle. He's a contemporary indigenous artist, just phenomenal person, educator, um, activist. Uh, he's really, we're talking about abstraction today in our program together, but he kind of takes abstraction to a whole new level, really combining influences like Rothko and Barnett Newman with indigenous sort of sacred geometry and um, drawing on his own experiences and sort of when abstraction is spiritually needed in art. 
So um, I highly recommend that exhibition. Definitely worth checking out. It just opened and it's on for a few months. Uh, great. So we also have uh, Woodstock, perfect, and hi everyone. We've got a question, um, great, also about the artist's name. So we're going to show them momentarily. They'll be up on the screen with the works of art. Wonderful. I will just take a moment to acknowledge too that the land the AGO is on is Mishisagik Nishinaabe territory, Mississauga. It is also governed by a treaty between the Mississauga of the Credit and the Canadian government. Toronto is Mishisagik Nishinaabe territory. It has also been occupied by other Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat Confederacies. I also just want to say a big thank you to Amica Senior Lifestyles, our lead sponsor of the Senior Social, for generously supporting this program. Here we go. There's the spelling that someone was looking for. So Denise Tomasos. Um, and you can see this particular one is called Made in Flight. And before I share with you some of the things that I've learned about this painting, um, and that I think you might find interesting about her biography and other background. Um, great. Oh, we've got a nice long, uh, a nice long introduction here. That's wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> also by Ella. Wonderful. Oh, good. And other people are validating. Yes, they've already seen Robert Hull. Nice, nice job getting on that on opening week. So they've already seen Robert Hull, and they confirm that it's awesome. Yeah, well, well worth your while to go. Thanks for that, Frank. Uh, great. So, yeah, let's take a look at this work by Denise Tomasos. And I'm curious to hear from you. Again, you can unmute yourselves or you could just type into the chat. How does this work make you feel? Think about some kind of adjective that when you look at it, just what, what kind of feelings um, come to mind, come to body? I find with abstraction, that's often the best place to start. Oh, someone's saying floaty. I like that, Marion. Yeah, floaty, curiosity. Chaotic. Claustrophobic, edgy. These are excellent words. Yeah, space, height. Layered. This is nice. We're kind of creating our own little poem here. Disoriented, movement, intrigued, intersecting. Very nice. Yeah, busy, like boats and structures in a flood. Ooh, <laughs> I like that a lot. Mm -hmm. I can absolutely see that. Yep, these sort of little, I can imagine these sort of little rowboats here, overlapping somehow. Multi-layered, interesting, metropolis, cluttered. Mm. Whole and in between. Ooh, beautiful words. Mm. Lovely. I have a feeling where Denise Tomas is alive right now, or wherever she might be listening in from, um, she'd be very pleased to hear all of these adjectives. Uh, and now let's move on to, let's take a closer look. Obviously, it's an abstract work, but she sometimes does include elements that look like they're representing something that we might see in everyday reality. So we've heard a little bit about that, like someone said, boats. What are some other things you see here? that, um, you know, remind you of something that you might encounter in your day-to-day -day world. Stairs. Yeah, buildings, doors, windows. <clears throat> yeah, it could look like trains. Nicely said, yeah, and I'll just kind of use my mouse cursor here. I see, yeah, it could resemble stairs or some kind of ladder over here. Others sort of clearly this, you know, three-dimensional kind of popping out Perspective type stairs. Yeah, someone else says water, boats, docks, doors and hallways. I get the sense of being like downtown, some kind of like downtown hustle and bustle city place. Yeah, water reflections. That's a really great observation. Yeah, it is kind of wobbly, right? When we look at this, it's hard to tell sort of what's solid and what's moving or what's a reflection of something else. A little bit trippy and kind of psychedelic. Someone's saying, yeah, after the tsunami, mm. for sure. Yeah, a little bit chaotic, um, things washed ashore maybe. Yeah, that's really, these are really great observations. Um, wonderful. Um, so I'm curious to know too, is this a place that you'd like to 
um, be in? Would you like to be kind of stuck in this particular scene? Nope, most people are saying nope, no way, no. Yeah, maybe if you could, some of you might expand on this and say why. Is it because it's too much of all of those things? Yeah, so Susan here is saying no, love the colors, but not the harsh lines. Yeah, oppressive, crowded, chaotic. Yeah, I love that word harsh too. Yeah, those really harsh lines, right? These are pretty phenomenal if we even just focus on the lines. We've got some that are these big sort of vertical drips, others that are very carefully measured and almost mathematical. Yeah, some folks think, yeah, the color seems inviting, but there's a sense of dread or something. Things crashing. Yeah, it's all jumbled and claustrophobic. Yeah, no space to breathe, very nicely said. Uh, Therese here is saying, yes, because maybe real to be included, so everyone is in everything. It can also show access opportunities, histories of the Very nice, yeah. Yeah, and all of these things are in here. This is one of the things I just love so much about abstraction, is that, you know, we're all already relating to this particular work in very personal ways and related to our own memories and travels and, and feelings, a uh, big sense of movement. Oh, someone saying, Lynn is saying, it looks like someone who's a hoarder. Yeah, imagine walking into, you know, opening a door and ending up here and thinking, oh, that sort of feeling, absolutely. Yeah, instability, very nice. Yeah, going back to that kind of wobbly, like reflection, things that ground isn't stable here. Very nice. Uh, I see someone else had typed into the chat there, wondering how it's a memory of her husband. So this is actually um, the person who donated it to the AGO, Gabrielle Israelovich. Um, she donated it in memory of her husband. So it wasn't um, it's uh, it wasn't Denise Tomasos who made this about her husband, as far as I know. Um, I believe it was sort of donated in, in the memory of, um, of uh, the donor's husband. Yeah, so all of these things, I think, really come into play here. Uh, Denise Tomasos was, she's a Canadian artist, um, but of Tr Trinidadian origin. And she recalled going through the school system in Ontario, um, how she was often one of the only black kids in her class. And then also how very specific histories, world histories, national histories were represented, and that her own often wasn't. And so she kind of sought out a lot of this history in her own way. And then later on, when she began to study art, brought it to the fore. And I'm going to share a quote with you in the chat here that I'll also read out. So this is something that she said in reference to many of her abstract works and her kind of style in general. So she said, I was struck by the premeditated, um, the premeditated, efficient, dispassionate records of human beings as cargo, and also by the deplorable conditions of the slave ships. So many Africans stacked and piled into the tiny airless holds. In my artwork, I used lines <clears throat> in deep space to recreate these claustrophobic conditions, leaving no room to breathe, to capture the feeling of confinement. I created three large scale black and white paintings of the structures that were used to contain slaves and left such catastrophic effects on the black psyche, the slave ship, the prison and the burial site. These became archetypal for me. I began to reconstruct and recycle their forms in all of my works. Great, so you can see already a lot of these things that even folks who weren't familiar with her or her style before, <clears throat> a lot of these words came up, right? And almost everybody said that they wouldn't wanna be in this image, they wouldn't wanna be in this moment in time. Um, and so all of these things I think have really beautiful sort of um, layered meanings behind them. So certainly I think we could see how Folks got a sense of like ocean travel and, and her references to slave ships here. These other little boats that, that folks saw also in a different light can appear a little bit like coffins. And then the, you know, a, a number of you had also said kind of hallways and this feeling of claustrophobic. And so this idea of entrapment sort of being stuck somewhere and not knowing the way out that one might relate to the prison system. And certainly, yeah, like industry here, we can see, you know, what looks like a train yeah, and I think, you know, it's, it's really quite fascinating how she wanted to draw on these experiences and like she said, sort of what's ingrained in the black psyche in abstracted ways, because um, we know how in many cases intergenerational trauma is not a literal thing, right? It's, it's more about a feeling, it's about fears, 
that sort of persist, even if dangers have subsided or, you know, historical dangers have subsided and new ones have appeared, the feelings, those feelings remain. Um, yeah, and someone else is saying, yeah, it's, it's important points to bring to life, interesting interpretation of that experience. Yeah, no human life, you're right, that it's kind of, it's this sort of design, right? These, these things that are designed to house or move humans, um, but you're absolutely right that we don't see any actually actual people represented here. And so, and yet we feel, we feel this, the presence of, of kind of design and industry. Yeah, very nicely said. Um, so I think for the sake of time, let's keep moving on. Um, this is a good introduction. The Art Gallery of Ontario actually owns a number of Denise Tomaso's works. And they all have this sort of similar effect, even though they look vastly different. There's another one that I just adore called Dismantle Number Two. I believe it's called Dismantle Number Two. Um, that uh, is similarly claustrophobic, and this use of lines kind of in every direction is disorienting and and oppressive at the same time. Uh, but that one is less sea-like and a lot more kind of almost like favelas or sort of like housing units. Um, the way that the cross hatching is is used it looks like yeah people living in really tight quarters that um that also indicate sort of the prison system there's a lot of things in there too that look like fences and on the one hand you think okay is that a protective measure or is that a way to exclude people from society or in the context of prison sort of these really high walls that um trap people yeah all right and here we go so let's look at our next work of art here uh, so this one here by Vasily Kandinsky, and this one is titled Gray Circle, 1923. Um, oh yeah, and great, someone else is, is sharing some inf interesting inf information and a great link on the topic of enslavement and stolen lands. This is really helpful. Thank you, Therese. Yeah, this is really great. And certainly, yeah, we, we you know, speak about um, slavery and colonization in, in Africa, certainly we know takes place in Canada too. It's one of the things that's really powerful about Robert Hool's abstract work on the on exhibit right now in his special special show at the AGO is that uh, it really talks about this history too <clears throat> and his own experience in residential school and um, uh, yeah, colonial <laughs> treaties and all of those things. All right, so Kandinsky here. Um, he went through a variety of different periods in his abstract art. So this particular one is a little more minimalist, I'll say. This one was done in 1923. So while he was in Germany, um, associated with the Bauhaus, and just before World War II kind of um, put a kibosh on that and then declared his art degenerate as the Nazis rose to power. But let's, uh, let's use some words again here. You folks are so great at finding really good adjectives to describe Tomaso's work. So let's do the same here. How, what kind of feelings would you associate with this particular canvas? You might also want to note how it, how it differs, maybe how these feelings are quite different than what we just experienced with Tomaso's. Musical, nicely said. Some violence there. Movement and flying, very nice. Yeah, there is, it's interesting. And the other one, we are sort of constrained and watery. And here it's, yeah, there we get a sense of height and flight. Conceptual, giving space for noise, very nice. Geometric, yeah, balanced, imbalance. Beautiful, mathematical, geometric, mechanical, movement. Yeah, clearly we have a lot of hard edges here, right? This isn't the sort of abstract work that he did before that We'll, we'll chat more about momentarily, but here we've got a lot of sort of hard edges, carefully measured geometric shapes, and it seems like things are mathematically arranged. Uh, fun. I like that contrast too. Yeah, in spite of the kind of careful intellectual rational measurement, there is a sort of sense of fight, uh, flight and fun here. Minimalist. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, moon vibes. <laughs> I like that. Someone's saying definite moon vibes from the gray circle here. Very nice. Yeah, energy. It's true, it's energetic. A lot of minimalist stuff sometimes uh, doesn't have the same kind of buoyancy or, um, or energy that, that Kandinsky's minimalist stuff does. So that's a great point to note. Yeah, openness, dance, mm -hmm. spacey, 
Beautifully said. Yeah, it's one of the things that I always admire in great artists is how they can make a flat surface seem like it's moving in some way. And I think especially here, I mean, it's easier to do if you're doing a landscape and, you know, it's a, it's a windy day by the lake and, and everyone who's looking at the work has had that experience of hearing the leaves and the trees and blowing in the wind and, you know, the, the sort of ripples of the water. That's one kind of movement, but abstract movement is, is very different, especially in a more minimalist style like this. Spacey, good word too. Yeah, and so Kandinsky had a really fascinating life. He was born in Russia, and uh, and someone else is saying, yeah, they find it more static. Yeah, and I could see that too. I think there there's parts of it that seem to dance for me, and other ones that are more kind of static and still. Yeah, intellectual. Um, uh, so yeah, he was born in Russia, and uh, he actually initially planned on studying law. He had studied music for quite a while and was really a talented musician and then career-wise decided that he would go to study law. And so that's what he was doing until one day he went to an art show and he discovered Monet's Haystack series. Imagine most people have heard about Claude Monet, sort of considered the grandfather of the Impressionist art style. And um, he uh, did a series of paintings of haystacks. Monet was very fascinated about change and sort of, um, he was reading a lot about Buddhist philosophy and this idea that the only thing that's constant in life is change. So Monet would return again and again to certain uh, places like these haystacks outside, um, like the cathedral in Rouen, um, poplar trees, and he would paint them in different lights, in different you know times of day, different seasons. And so Kandinsky stumbled upon this. And at first he saw this haystack series and basically thought, this is bizarre, like there's unfinished work by an artist in a show. Well, how did this get on, you know, how did this get on the wall? <laughs> this isn't complete. Um, and then slowly realized, wait a second, this is a whole new style. This is a whole new way of seeing the world, of depicting the world, and was completely overtaken by this. And so much so that he abandoned his law career um, and started to study art. And so at that point, he moved to Munich in Germany, and he tried a few different art schools. He didn't like the instruction at some of them, and then um, eventually did, and um, really latched on to abstraction. So he was born, you know, kind of the generation after Monet, and so he was really brought up in the era of Fauvism and post-Impressionism and the beginnings of abstraction. A lot of people consider him one of the very first real abstract artists, so um, abstraction was very new at the time. Although Robert Hull would disagree, Robert Hull would, would say, no, no, if you go back thousands of years and look at uh, designs on Ojibwe um, artworks or um, kind of sacred medicine bags, that abstraction already existed in other parts of the world. Um, but a lot of sort of Eurocentric art history textbooks would, um, would argue that this was the early days of abstraction. Um, yeah, other people are saying kind of, yeah, spirituality, dance, choreography, <clears throat> great. And so Kandinsky really um, started to experiment with this. And when I say fauvism, that means really kind of wild colors. In, in French, fauve is, is wild. And so it was artists who were taking the ideas of, of Impressionists, like Claude Monet, and leaving their studios, going to paint outside. But rather than try to capture something with photographic kind of realism or you know, academic style representation, they were much more interested in the feeling. So if they were looking at a landscape, they would think, okay, what kind of energy is in this landscape? Oh yeah, so I'm gonna paint this grass bright purple because that's what it feels like. I'm gonna paint this sky, you know, green here with a blast of yellow here because that's what it feels like in this moment of the day in this particular place. Um, and so that's what fauvism was all about. Very controversial at the time. Again, the academy in Europe, they, especially in places like, like Paris, was quite strict and we're starting to be open to new new styles but all of these things were considered very bold and very different and very scary for um, the art world and so Kandinsky was enthralled by this and he was a big part of it um, I have a link here I'm gonna share uh, I wonder if I can actually I might ask one of my colleagues to do this who's there in the background if they could share that link I shared with them earlier um, that would be really helpful because it just links to a few other works by Kandinsky that are a little bit earlier. So in, um, 
So he, there we go. So if you feel like clicking on that uh, yourselves and are able to draw up on your screen some of the, especially the first one on the list that pops up, you'll see is a little bit earlier in his career before World War I. Um, and around that time, he was really focusing on abstraction and bringing it together with music. He had a really special talent uh, for combining kind of color and sound. A lot of people have sort of posthumously diagnosed him as having synesthesia. Have folks heard about this before? Synesthesia? It essentially means that two of your senses get mixed up and or combined in sort of powerful ways. I would see it more like a superpower, but it could prove difficult. And so for him, it was vision and sound. And he first encountered this when he went to an opera and he was sort of sitting there listening to the music and all of a sudden every note that was played was correlated with a particular color in his imagination. And so he went home and he was able to paint the symphony essentially. Um, and so that continued in his work and it's interesting because it seems like even those who didn't know this about um, his personality or what synesthesia was noted that his work is really quite musical in many ways. And so for him, when he sat down at the canvas and started from a place of vision, um, he would do that. He would, you know, use a bright purple in one corner and that would create a certain sound for him and, and so on with different colors. And so it really was quite, quite musical. And then later on, I mean, during the First World War, he ended up having to um, leave. He went back to Russia and then um, ended up uh, back in Germany and very much associated with the Bauhaus. So these were, again, a really interesting group because they were bringing together dancers and musicians and designers and uh, painters and all sorts of other artists to collaborate and to work in this sort of, minimalism isn't the right way, but that's part of the aesthetic, this idea of kind of um, function over form and to simplify, just like in the art world, um, a lot of modern artists were taking something in reality, whether it was a landscape, whether it was an individual sort of model posing, they were taking that as a starting point, but then trying to, um, you know, remove everything that's frivolous and just get down to the essence of what that uh, object or person or place was that they were representing. The Bauhaus were trying to do this with furniture design too, and it still plays a lot into, um, you know, furniture that's bought and sold today. And so he was associated with this group he also started up the group, um, the Blue Rider group, which was one of the first groups sort of bringing a lot of these new aesthetics together in art and um, really embracing abstraction. They were publishing about what they were doing because a lot of people in you know, general society in the art world didn't really understand. So they took it upon themselves to you know, create manifestos and other explanations of what, what was actually going on. Um, and so this one that we're looking at here, you can see it's uh, dated 1923. So this is just after he had returned to Germany. And these are really the early Bauhaus years for him. And so his work became much, um, yeah, much more sort of minimalist, much more geometric. If you look at this one here, you can see there's what resembles maybe a bike wheel or maybe a slice of orange or something that you might see in reality. And you know, you could associate it perhaps with some modernist furniture, these kind of, you know, very simple style floating chairs or other things like that. And so that's really what, what he was experimenting with in this particular moment. And uh, if we look at the wall of our friends in, in Quebec, <laughs> we have, do you folks know the title of that one you have behind you there? Because that one, I, you know, the one that they have in there, in their room there is much more what my imagination automatically associates with Kandinsky. Uh, if you don't know the name, that's totally fine. They're, they're sometimes titled untitled anyways. Um, but uh, yeah, this one you can see this real sense of, of movement going on and there is still some geometry and geometric shapes that are kind of colored in, but, um, uh, but yeah, very different style and much less minimalist. In writing about um, the white and the black in his work, it, he said that for him, white seemed to represent kind of like infinite possibilities in life that, uh, you know, there's no actual sort of predetermined path for us. 
Oh, perfect. So Philip here is saying it's 1923 from the MoMA. Lovely. Thank you. So really interesting because right around the same time period. That's super. Um, so uh, yeah, for him, white, this white, these kind of stark white backgrounds represented infinite possibility and, you know, exciting life before us and choices that we have to make. And then often the black that kind of cuts its way through was more associated with death um, for him or danger or how, you know, the thing that's so great about life is we never know what's going to happen and things are quite exciting. But then at the same time, it can be cut abruptly short. And so for him, this kind of stark black um, was also associated with, with sort of danger and, and finality of things. So we are going to experiment a little bit right now uh, with color and these sort of black and white lines. I'm going to share my screen in a different way. And I will tell you that this is one of my favorite art activities to do. It's relatively simple, um, but ends up looking really great and very Kandinsky-like. And so I'll share with you the materials that I have here. Um, I'm not sure if all of you were able to see on the, on the sign up um, the materials that we'd be using today. And so some of you might have these on hand and others might not. But uh, it is lots of fun. So what I have here is some black India ink. And I've just poured some, I'll add a little more here too. I've just poured some into this little dish. And string, so I have yarn. Um, Probably not the best, or a kind of a little bit heavier string would be ideal, but, but wool yarn works just fine too. And then I also have watercolor paints and a watercolor brush and some water just to help with the process. So this is lots of fun to do. If you do have these uh, um, materials with you, please just set them up. The first step, and here's where we're going to get very Kandinsky-ish, so the first step is just to work with the ink. I'm going to just spurt a little bit more out here. And then you're going to want to dip your string or your rope, whatever it is you're using, your yarn, into the ink and make sure it's well coated. And here's the really fun part. You're going to drag it over to your watercolor paper, whatever other paper you have, and sort of just drag it along. And just Think about what we've seen with Kandinsky so far. Let it dance on your page a little bit. <clears throat> and yeah, so for those who are working on their piece here, you can decide for yourself when is enough. You might be more inspired by Kandinsky's kind of minimalist um, works and just do a few lines. I'm going to go more for the the dancing ones that I love so much, like our friends in Ottawa have on their wall. And when you think you've had enough there, enough black lines, then you can move on to the watercolor. And so here is um, where uh, you might want to do a little bit of pre-planning. What Kandinsky tends to do is kind of color in the areas where there's some sort of geometric shapes that are forming. Um, so you might want to do that. Just going to go on here. So, yeah, I think I think you're right, Tehez. I think Frank was referring to the first part there. Yeah, if, Frank, if you want to type your question into the chat, I'll be able to uh, to respond, I think, more clearly. All right, so I'm going to dip this into the water here. And you can decide, too, one of the things that's really quite lovely about Kandinsky's work, too, is that he plays a lot with what's called saturation of paint. And so at moments, you'll have colors that are sort of very, very dark. So less water, more paint. There we go. And then other moments, you might decide to do a little bit off here to do sort of more water and less paint. So I'll do a little bit here with the green. Let's see, there's a good spot for that. There we go. So this will be a little bit more washed out, at least for the bottom part. And then I'll lift the corners here. There we go. Mm 
Let the color sort of seep in together. And if anybody who's doing this at home um, would like to uh, would like to show their work in any way. Oh good, I'm just scrolling down the videos here and I see lots of folks are, are working on this, that's perfect. We can probably already start to see how Kandinsky-like this is really looking. You want to be a little bit careful if you end up touching the black ink just to make sure that it's it's dry in the section that you're uh, that you're painting before you before you blend the colors too much without intending to. And what's lovely about this too is there's really no right or wrong way to to do this. It reminds me a lot in some ways of the the activities that kids tend to do. I have a little three-year-old daughter and she's just old enough now to like start to color in the lines a little bit and so you take a black marker and sort of just scribble and then fill in those little spots but um, these ones here look much more much more similar to Kandinsky style. But I'm curious to know too. Um, thanks. Oh yeah, I see here. Okay, so Frank. Oh, thanks for explaining that, Frank. Yeah, it was actually another device in the background that had a a webinar. <laughs> okay, it did sound a little bit like that, and I thought, hmm, sounds like someone's referring to an interesting book that uh, I've not read. Uh, yeah, no problem at all. <laughs> And uh, yeah, Frank, others are, <laughs> others are asking for the reference because that webinar sounded interesting. So if you feel like sharing, sharing what you were listening to, seems like others would, would be keen to, to tune in later too. Um, so Philip here is asking, how large were Kandinsky's canvases? Um, they were quite large. I mean, not, um, not mural size, but typically I'd say, you know, often sort of about a, me uh, a meter, a little more than a meter. Um, a little bit longer too. Well, Frank, I think Frank, I think you did the opposite there. I think you're now back uh, to being heard. There you go. Perfect. Yeah. So yeah. So they were quite large, and he did want people to be able to stand in front of them and sort of get get wrapped in them. Most of them. I mean, he did do some smaller ones too. Um, but yeah, not not as large as some of the other. Some of the other, uh, you know, Jackson Pollock style, say for example, um, but still, yeah, relatively, relatively large. And so, for those of you who are doing this at home, uh, is anybody keen on on holding their work up and sharing what you've created so far? Oh my! Check it out. I can't actually see the names of folks. Um, um, the way my, my thing is set up, but the woman here in the red shirt who just held hers up, that's extraordinary. That's lovely. Thank you. Anybody else like to share? Let's see. Oh, wait, we have somebody else here. Beautiful. Look at that. And I love the other thing I love about these so much is that each one is really so different. Um, Oh, here we go. Okay, we've, I see 
a video here with two folks side by side, both wearing glasses. Wonderful. And if you could just hold it a tiny bit closer to the screen. Oh my, look at that. Oh, that's kind of blurry. There <laughs> oh, there we go. There's Mary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's sort of blurry. I mean, it's, I can't. Oh my, look at that. I don't These know. Are great. Thank you for sharing. Um, the first, the first one in that in that group here who just showed me that one for some reason my mind went right to like a forest floor and these really interesting sort of sticks and, and brambles and stuff on the ground. Um, all right, let's see. change my gallery here if anybody else would care to share, and if not, that's totally fine too. Um, I'm going to keep working on mine. It's it's one too that I find just really nice and meditative. Um, and yeah, the ink just kind of gives it a bit of an extra, I don't know, extra power here, um, extra intensity that, that doesn't quite work as well if you just were to use black watercolor or, or marker, but totally a fine substitute if that's all you have at home. And I'm really, yeah, really impressed by what folks have created so far. So please do continue working. We've come to the end of our session today. And I will let you know too, in January, these sessions are gonna continue and in January, we're trying something a little bit new. We're gonna have myself and an artist from the AGO and we're gonna do a little bit in conversation. So you could see essentially two of us working on a piece at the same time, um, discussing some of the work, discussing her practice. So uh, yeah, we'll, we'll be back in the new year and the format will be slightly different, but equally as engaging, I hope, if not more so. Um, and also, if you feel so inclined, we would love to hear from you. My colleague is just going to put a link to our survey in the chat. And so if you're able to click on that before we, you know, I kind of officially end the Zoom session for today, um, that would be great because your feedback is really important. And these sessions are really for you. So if there are things you want more or less of, uh, don't be shy. Just let us know. And yeah, please do continue working on your, your beautiful painting. And I hope you all have a great rest of the uh, day and essentially rest of 2021. It's been a heck of a year for many of us. And um, I hope that you all find some rest in the, in the coming weeks this month. Uh, thank you. Oh, well, that's great. And there's lovely comments here. Yeah, I really enjoyed the session today too. So thanks so much for all of your insights and uh, all of your comments. Now we're all going to search what that webinar is that Frank was listening to that sounded so interesting. <laughs> Um, and yeah, and we'll connect again soon here in the new year. Thank you so much, everybody. Take good care. See you next time. Bye.